Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us bright and early this morning. I'm Ros Beaver. I'm the National Head of Family Law here at Owen Mitchell. I'm joined by my colleague, Jenna Lucas, who will facilitate questions today. But the real stars of our show are our fabulous expert panellists. For today's purposes, our actors too. And they are from 1GC. They are Janet Baisley QC, a leading light in the world of arbitration. Janet also sits as a part-time judge in both civil and family cases. And for today's purposes, she's absolutely wonderful because she trains arbitrators too. Just what we need today. We have Andrew Norton QC, Joint Head of Chambers at 1GC, also a qualified arbitrator. He's passionate about alternative methods of dispute resolution as a means of concluding cases and has a wealth of experience in these areas. Finally, we're joined by Claire Heppenstall, um, who is also a qualified arbitrator and a dual qualified arbitrator dealing with both financial and children cases, which is something that is a brilliant method for trying to cut through and navigate cases particularly, for example, where you have a case where it's a private children uh, dispute and there might be an issue in relation to Schedule 1. I have got to deal with some housekeeping issues. Um, we will have a live chat as we go through. This is being recorded today. Thank you to those who've already submitted questions, but you can continue to submit questions as we go. We are recording the virtual event, as I've already said. Please do try and engage as much as you can, and we will try and deal with your questions as we go. We have a brilliant opportunity today, and we're incredibly grateful to Janet, Andrew and Claire for taking the time out of their busy schedules, not only to show us how it's done, but also for pulling together a really on point um, case study and it will be at the heart, no doubt, of our caseloads as we career towards the end of the restrictions. And we see lots of cases where there are some disputes in relation to um, holidays. As with all of us, we've seen seminars, we've, we've been engaged in looking at alternative dispute resolution, but possibly have not embraced it as much previously as we ought to have done. It's an absolutely ideal opportunity today for us to see exactly how it works in practice. And I'm so delighted that we've got such experts here to talk to us and show us how it's done. And I'm going to hand over to Janet, who will take over from here. Well, good morning, everyone. And thank you very much for that very generous introduction. Um, Andrew, Claire and I are delighted to be doing this mock arbitration with Erwin Mitchell. And we are going to do it as um, a mock directions hearing followed by a full arbitral hearing. But just before we do that, and I know um, quite a number of you are trained as arbitrators, but for those who aren't, we thought it would just be helpful to run very quickly through the process of arbitration. So I wonder if I might have the next slide, please. So it starts when the parties agree because it's a voluntary process. In children cases, they complete a form ARB1CS. And I know that you have been sent in advance and may have had the opportunity to read just a blank form and also one completed for the purposes of our mock arbitration today. That form, as you know, has safeguarding um, questionnaires attached to it. The parties have to do their safeguarding checks. They identify and agree a choice of arbitrator or they can ask IFLA to nominate an arbitrator or they can agree an arbitrator in the way that happens with single joint experts by one party putting up three names and the other party choosing. It's a voluntary bespoke process which parties decide for themselves how they're going to deal with it. Once the forms are signed and the arbitrator's terms are agreed, the arbitration starts and one of the arbitrator's duties is to register the arbitration with resolution who are collating details of arbitrations undertaken. Then there is usually an initial directions hearing followed by the actual arbitration. Have a next slide, please. Um, 
safeguarding is important in arbitration. If there isn't a court application, there won't be the usual Kafka safeguarding checks. So the parties are required under the rules to obtain their own, which is pretty much what Kafka gets from the disclosure and barring service, which will permit applications for individuals for just a basic criminal records check. Um, it's a very simple process. You apply online, there's a small fee, um, and then you get your check back fairly quickly and send it to the arbitrator. Have the next slide, please. We're going to be doing first the mock directions hearing, at which the arbitrator will consider with the parties the evidential issues in the dispute, whether there is a requirement for, uh, in this case, an ISW, in other cases, it might be another expert, the format of the arbitral hearing is decided because the parties have a say in how it's conducted. Should it be in person? Should there be live evidence? Should there be oral submissions, written submissions, or how should it be done? It's very flexible. And they will then set out the timetable for the process. Um, next slide, please. And then um, we have the actual mock arbitral hearing where we will have submissions on behalf of the father whose application it is, followed by the mother, and then the father whose application it is may have the last word. And then what happens is the arbitrator will, having thought about it, send out a, a judgment, we call them determinations, which will be handed down in writing, usually within a week of the hearing. If it's a very urgent matter, it might be much sooner. Thank you. If you could take the slides away. I'm just going to now outline very briefly the case study, and I know that was sent out to you, um, but just for those who may not have had a chance to read it. Um, we've got Hugo and Natasha, the parents whose child Stanley is three. And um, the issue, grave and weighty matter, is whether or not Hugo should be allowed to take little Stanley on holiday to his parents Gite in France together with the new woman Cynthia and her two twins and since they separated there hasn't been a great deal of contact for Hugo. Um, Stanley's mother would say because Hugo works too hard as a commercial lawyer and doesn't have enough time for his son Hugo will say because Natasha is clingy and overprotective and hasn't really um, progressed contact. So the, the issue is, should Stanley now, who hasn't stayed overnight with his father for more than one night, um, travel to France, a long journey to the mid Pyrenees, to a great rambling house with um, Miss Smith, the new partner, and the twins whom he hasn't yet met, um, or should he, as the mother says, not go to France and perhaps have a few days in England as his first holiday away with his father? So now we're going to go to the mock directions hearing and we have Mr Andrew Norton QC who is instructed on behalf of Hugo and we have Miss Claire Heppenstall who is instructed on behalf of Natasha. And you may have seen in your pack the ARB 1CS, which sets out the basic details of the solicitors and so on, which signs up to um, safeguarding and which um, is signed by the parties to confirm that they know that this is a binding process. So I'm now going to call on Mr Norton to um, make submissions in relation to directions. Yes, Mr Norton. Good morning, madam. As you know, I represent the uh, father, Mr. Hugo Beresford, who I refer to either as Mr. Beresford or father. And uh, Ms. Heppenstall represents the mother, Natasha Beresford. <clears throat> uh, the parents, uh, madam, are also present at this uh, directions here remotely, as we all are. And uh, we, uh, both Ms. Heppenstall and I, have the way of communicating with them um, outside of this process. As you know, Madam, this is a directions hearing following the parents having signed the form ARB1CS and signing up for arbitration of the uh, application by Mr. Beresford 
to take uh, his son Stanley to France uh, this coming summer. His proposal is to travel to France in early August. Uh, he proposes to stay at his parents' property and that property is effectively open to him whenever he is able to travel. And he has not uh, at this time actually booked flights and other details, although of course when he has done so subject to Madame your determination, um, he uh, would provide those details to the mother. Thank you. In terms of the directions today, Madam, the parties have been able to agree a significant number of those. They've been able to agree that both the father and the mother should file a brief statements of evidence relative to the issues that are before you. Um, in fact, a lot of work, as you would expect, has been done on that process already, and we would be in a position for the father's team to file and uh, provide that statement within a week, so by the 2nd of February. Thank you. Mother would follow a week later, so that is the 9th of February. And it is agreed that if the father feels that there is something the mother has raised that he has not already addressed in his statement, he might file a very short further statement. The date for that is agreed at the 16th of February. Uh, both Miss Heppenstall and I would file skeleton arguments which we will do a week later, so that takes us to the 23rd of February, which means, Madam, that uh, we would be ready for an arbitration uh, sometime after uh, the end of February. Right. It is agreed, Madam, uh, that there ought to be the opportunity for brief oral evidence from each parent uh, during the arbitration, and on that basis, Ms. Heppenstall and I anticipate that the time needed for the arbitration is a day which will allow time for that evidence, uh, some brief submissions based on our skeleton arguments. Madam, I'm afraid we've been unable to agree one issue, and that is whether it is necessary for there to be the instruction of an independent social worker to assist you in your determination on this issue uh, before you. Right. The mother seeks an independent social worker. Uh, that is not agreed by the father for three main reasons. Perhaps I can just briefly outline those. There are, as you know, Madam, no welfare concerns in this particular case. These safeguarding checks have come back and there is nothing revealed within those which questions the need for uh, the instruction of independent social worker. We would say, Madam, you're in perfectly able uh, under the welfare checklist to consider all of the matters relevant for this particular issue and the instruction of an independent social worker is therefore unnecessary. <clears throat> the second reason is that this application is something that is causing the father some stress. He wants to uh, book a holiday with his son and the instruction of an independent social worker will delay uh, that determination. And the um, other matter that he bears in mind is that if there is an independent social worker instructed, it is likely to lead to an elongation of the hearing and therefore where we have agreed one day, uh, we probably would need a day and a half or two days. Thank you. Um, right, shall I hear from Miss Heppenstall now, please? Um, Madam, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, it is agreed, as Mr Norton has outlined, the timetable for the filing of uh, statements, uh, skeleton arguments, etc. Um, if I can just deal with the uh, instruction of an ISW, which yes. my client does seek. Um, Madam, it's accepted that this is a case where there are no safeguarding concerns. Uh, both parties have made that clear on the ARB C1S. Uh, which has been filed and signed uh, and also the police checks, uh, the DBS checks have come back. Um, there, there is nothing that need concern you in that respect. But this is a very young child. Uh, Stanley is only three um, and he's been having limited time overnight. He's only ever had one night at a time with his father. Um, and so mother very much uh, believes and contends that actually the, the tribunal is going to be assisted by having the input of an experienced ISW uh, who would be able to deal with the welfare issues which you will obviously have to consider in the course of the arbitral hearing and particularly um, Stanley's ability to manage 
such a lengthy time away from his primary carer, um, which is mother's uh, primary concern. Um, and also, mother would say that actually she's got specific concerns about this property because she has visited there previously. Um, I feel very much welcome and I think the court, the tribunal, sorry, would be assisted by having uh, the ISW visit uh, the property um, and the area. Um, we say that there would not be any particular delay because obviously uh, father is not proposing to go on holiday before I think the beginning of August uh, at the earliest and so there's plenty of time in which an ISW could do a proper report um, and we have put forward um, uh, Mrs Smith and her CV has been circulated and I think madam it's in uh, the bundle that you've got you'll see that she's very experienced. Um, she, uh, I have to accept, uh, she isn't willing to travel until Covid restrictions are lifted uh, and I also accept that she has indicated to the parties yesterday that she isn't willing to visit if she has to uh, undergo any quarantine. But given that uh, that's COVID restrictions are likely to be lifted, hopefully in the next few months, uh, we would say we can still uh, obtain a report properly from her with her visiting uh, the area uh, and uh, have a determination well before the holiday uh, plans uh, that father has advanced. Um, and so for all those reasons, we do uh, seek that uh, an, an ISW, Mrs Smith in particular, is instructed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Heppenstall. Um, I am dealing with directions in relation to this arbitration, which is a specific issue in relation to whether Stanley should go on holiday with his father to France for a week during this summer. Happily, the parties have been able to agree most of the directions and I'm very happy to endorse the directions in relation to statements which have been outlined for me and also in relation to skeleton arguments. Um, I'm content um, since it's the party's choice to have um, brief oral evidence from each party and therefore to list the matter accordingly. The one issue that is disputed is whether I should give the parties permission to jointly instruct an independent social worker. Um, Ms Heppenstall makes that application on the basis of Stanley's very young age, the fact that he hasn't yet been abroad with his father. The mother has a number of concerns, she says, about the Jeet in the Pyrenees to which it is intended Stanley will be taken. And um, she seeks an arrangement whereby the independent social worker will actually go to France and look at the premises and consider the area and so on. The mother has outlined certain other concerns in relation to the trip, which she says um, require the instruction of an independent social worker. However, it's except that Mr Norton opposes the application. He says that there are no welfare concerns or safeguarding issues. Um, that fact is accepted by the mother and he says there are problems with instructing an independent social worker in terms of delay, the length of the arbitral hearing and so on. Um, having carefully considered this application, I have to consider whether the instruction of an independent social worker is necessary within the meaning of part 25 of the rules and um, re-HL in relation to the definition of necessary. I have come to the clear conclusion that although I understand the mother's concerns, the instruction of a, an independent social worker in a matter such as this is not necessary or proportionate. It seems to me that I can perfectly well deal with the welfare issue involved without the need to instruct an independent social worker and without the need of the assistance which an independent social worker might bring to the detail of the case. So um, I'm against you, I'm afraid, Ms Heppenstall, but I will list the matter therefore for one day. Um, perhaps we could do that between councils, clerks and identify a date that is convenient to um, both parties and their uh, lay clients. Thank you. So coming out of role now briefly, that deals with the um, standard interim directions that might be made on a case such as this. In fact, after the directions hearing, the parties had another word with each other and came to the conclusion that they did not 
um, require oral evidence from either of them. And therefore it was possible to list the arbitration quickly for a half day hearing on submissions only. So we now move to the full arbitral hearing. And I'm going to call on Mr Norton again. Mr Norton, this is your application. And I, I understand that the parties are content to deal with the matter on oral submissions only. Is that right? Madam, yes. Thank you very much. Um, as you have uh, been made aware, having uh, filed uh, an exchange statements, uh, Ms. Heppenstall and I were able to have a discussion and it was apparent that in fact there is no evidence required. We are enormously grateful to you and your clerks for having identified an earlier date when we could hear uh, this arbitration and, and as you've outlined uh, for a shorter period of time. Madam, the uh, both Ms. Eppenswell and I have uh, filed and exchanged skeleton arguments which you have within your bundle um, and I don't uh, propose simply to outline each element of my skeleton arguments which sets out the father's case uh, in detail I hope. So, yes it does, thank you. Thank you. Madam, just so you have a flavour as it were, um, as you will know from the documents filed and the statements exchanged, uh, the parents separated in January of 2020. At that time, Stanley was, of course, two years and six months old. And the father has been able to see Stanley regularly ever since separation. Right. Though not for as long as he would be. Uh, there have been discussions between the parents to try and increase the amount of time. And as you know, from August of 2020, uh, it was possible to agree uh, for the father to have Stanley overnight. Uh, well, sorry, from August 2020, it was possible to agree for the father to have Stanley for the full day uh, on a Saturday. And as from November, it, it moved to overnight for one night at the weekend on alternate Saturdays. And so the pattern as it stands at the moment, madam, is that each Saturday the father sees Stanley and on each alternate Saturday that is overnight to Sunday. Right. You can be aware that Mr um, Beresford wishes to take Stanley on holiday in August, some four months away, and on that basis there would be effectively eight further times or so when he would have Stanley overnight. Yes, thank you. In terms of the practical arrangements, Madam, for the holiday, as I indicated at the directions hearing, uh, the father had not yet booked his uh, travel. Uh, but he would wish to have Stanley overnight on the Friday uh, before everybody flies on the Saturday. That way Stanley was settled with the father, the, uh, he and his father, Miss Smith and her children could wake up together and travel to Gatwick uh, where the flight goes to Toulouse uh, and they would uh, be in France, in southern France, uh, later that afternoon. Uh, Stanley would spend a week with his father they would travel back the following Saturday and Stanley would be back with his mother late Saturday of the following week. Right. Madam, as I've indicated, I don't propose simply to repeat the contents of my skeleton argument, but may I just address three matters from the father's document and respond to three matters from the submissions um, on behalf of the mother? Yes, of course, and I should make clear that I've read the bundle and um, the party's statements and, of course, the skeleton arguments of counsel. Thank you very much, Madam. Well, just to pick up on three matters then. The first is in relation to legal principles. And I, of course, no, Madam, I don't need to remind you of the legal principle uh, relevance to this arbitration. But what has been made on the model's behalf of the fact that Stanley uh, spends the majority of his time with his mother, and that is not disputed. Uh, but of course, Madam, both parents share parental responsibility. And there is nothing in law to suggest that a resident parent's uh, parental responsibility takes primacy over the responsibility of the non-resident parent. And, and the father very much feels that on occasions, his views and his suggestions are dismissed by the mother on the basis that she knows Stanley best because she is, uh, he is living with her and she effectively seeks to trump his parental responsibility, if I may put it that way. 
The other legal principle, madam, that of course you will be familiar with, is the importance for the, uh, the uh, uh, arbitrator to recognise that it is uh, presumed to be in Stanley's best interests and welfare to spend time with his father and for that element of Stanley's life to be promoted unless the contrary is shown. And of course, you would have seen from these statements from the mother, no contrary argument is put in that respect. The second element I would like to draw out, Madam, is this, uh, and it looks at some of the factors of the welfare checklist. Um, looking at Stanley's age and his emotional needs, of course, Stanley at three is entirely dependent on his primary carers, both his mother when he's with her, but also his father. But it does benefit his welfare to spend significant amounts of time with his father and with others to aid his socialisation. The father doesn't wish to uh, unduly criticise the mother, but you would have seen from his statements that he has some anxiety that when Stanley is with his mother, she very much treats him as a young infant and doesn't allow him to socialise with his peers and others to broaden his uh, social instincts. Uh, as uh, Mr Beresford has said in his statement, uh, Stanley has a, a cousin, uh, the father's sister. The cousin Jack is the same age as Stanley, but when the mother and father lived together, uh, they, they used to have disagreements as to whether Stanley could spend playdates uh, with Jack, and the mother was very resistant to that. And although that is not entirely on point in terms of this holiday, it is relevant from the father's perspective, bearing in mind the mother's resistance to Stanley meeting uh, Miss Smith's uh, two children. I think he's met Miss Smith a few times, has he? Madam, that is correct. There was agreement and, and, and it's right to point out, in fact, uh, that um, Mr Beresford has been very respectful of the mother's request in that regard. He recognises it would have been inappropriate for Stanley to meet a Miss Smith immediately. Miss Beresford, Beresford outlined her concerns and he listened to those concerns. And so it was by agreement uh, that Mr Beresford delayed uh, Stanley meeting Miss Smith and he didn't meet her until Miss Beresford was comfortable about that. But of course, she still puts in place the embargo on Stanley meeting Miss Beresford's children. I do wonder whether meeting them on the holiday is the for the first time is the best way forward, Mr Norton. Um, what does your client say about that? Could that happen in advance? No. I'm reminded to allow the holiday. Yes, I'm just in fact, Madam, receiving a message from my client who has indicated that he would be delighted to introduce Stanley to Miss Beresford's, Beresford's children in advance of the holiday uh, and wonders therefore whether as part of your determination you might consider uh, a phased introduction as it were, so meeting uh, uh, Miss Smith's children on one of the earlier contact uh, visits. Mm. Content for that. Thank you. And on that, and in in that vein, there's also the issue about him only having spent one night away from his mother and and with your client. Um, and I can see that the mother might well be concerned about seven or eight nights away uh, from her, and uh, seven of those nights in a foreign country where he can't easily return to her if he if he misses her too much. What does your client say about that, Mr Norton? Madam, I was able to speak to Mr Beresford, of course, before this uh, arbitration, and he is aware that he doesn't wish to unduly push Miss Beresford, although, of course, the fact they're in arbitration is an indication that they can't agree everything. It is uh, fast approaching Easter, uh, and it may be that over the Easter uh, holiday, there could be an extension of the one night to two nights or possibly even three as a slow introduction to the week's holiday in August. And if that goes well, which of course Mr Beresford anticipates it's, it will, um, that pattern could in, uh, continue between Easter and August so that uh, Stanley is used to spending more than one night with his father. That would be entirely um, 
agreeable to Mr Beresford. Right, well I'll hear Ms Heppenstall on that in a moment. Um, perhaps you could then address the various concerns the mother has. Um, first about um, the health issues. I, I know Stanley has some asthma, uses an inhaler. And I think one of the mother's concerns is the remoteness of Saint-Lizaire um, and the availability of medical help should it be required. Yes. Madam, uh, dealing with Stanley's health issues, uh, of course, this goes back in some respects to the first point I made in respect to parental responsibility, because Miss Beresford doesn't have a monopoly on being concerned about Stanley's health issue. Both parents have had some training in uh, Stanley's asthma issues, although you may consider, Madam, that the prospects of an attack uh, in southern France during the summer are not as great as perhaps the mother might uh, suggest. The other aspect is that uh, Mr Beresford spends time not only with Stanley without, his, without incident, but also spends time with his nephew Jack, to whom I've referred. And again, that is always without incident. He is as concerned with Stanley's safety as the mother. The mother does, I'm afraid, rather exaggerate Stanley's health issues as well. You see in reference within her statement to a gluten intolerance. Uh, which the father takes seriously because uh, he wishes to uh, ensure that the mother recognises uh, that he wishes to care for Stanley well. But he would say that on each occasion that Stanley has been in his care, there has been no sign at all of any gluten intolerance or any dietary issues for Stanley. And so, Madam, I urge you to express, to uh, use some caution in accepting the characterization by Miss Beresford as Stanley being some rather sickly child. He clearly is not. Then there are the issues that, thank you, the, the, the issues in relation to the long journey, um, which mother's concerned about, and um, the premises themselves in Saint Lazare. Um, what does your client say about those matters? Um, it is a relatively long journey, although not certainly long. And uh, as you've heard me indicate earlier, one way of breaking the journey up would be for Stanley to spend Friday night with his father uh, so that he doesn't have to be collected from his mother and then go immediately to the airport. The flight is no more than a couple of hours. And on the issue of the flight, Madam, Mr Beresford has explained to me that he um, has missed out on a number of firsts for Stanley because Stanley has been with his mother. Stanley has in fact travelled to the Gite before when the parents were together, although as a very young uh, baby. And so effectively this flight would be the first time that Stanley takes a flight where he is aware of the circumstances of that journey. And the father has explained to me he very much would like to share that experience with his son uh, as a, a first for him and a bonding moment, if I can put it in that way. In, in terms of the journey from the airport to the Gite, it's a matter of a couple of hours. And as I've said, uh, Mr Beresford is aware of Stanley's welfare. He anticipates Stanley may fall asleep in the car on the way there. Uh, but if, as the mother fears, he suffers from some form of travel sickness, the father will deal with that entirely appropriately. He might stop off and have a little snack, but, and he will be very alive to stand his work <coughs> and his needs, as he has always been. Thank you. Finally, Madam, if I just may touch briefly on the issue of the property. Um, it is a property with which both Miss Beresford and Mr Beresford are familiar, having spent family holidays there. Uh, it is a large property. But we've set out in our skeleton argument the outline, the, the framework of that property, where the um, bedrooms are. And uh, Stanley will be in a room next to his father, will be close to him at all times. And although Miss Beresford has, has expressed anxiety, Stanley will not be monitored. That is certainly not the case. Uh, Mr Beresford will be very alive to any safety issues in respect to the pool, for example. Uh, while he spends some important quality time with his son. Thank you. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say at this point? I will come back to you in case there's anything you want to say in response. 
Madam, I think not. I, I started my submissions by saying that I would respond in, to three aspects of the mother's case, but as in the questions you've raised with me, I think we've very much covered those. But if there are matters that you would wish me to expand mm -hmm. or arise from the observations of Ms. Heppensfield, I will, of course, be happy to respond at that time. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. So over to you, Ms. Heppensfield, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam. Um, Madam, obviously Stanley's welfare is your paramount concern and you will be applying the welfare checklist under Section 1 of the Children Act uh, when you come to consider uh, where his welfare lies in relation to the father's application. Um, mother accepts that it might be thought at the outset that a holiday abroad to France would be a proposal with which there could be very little uh, dispute or indeed serious objection um, and that it was something that all children would naturally welcome um, and that you should be giving permission very easily. Um, on behalf of mother, we would say that that's a very dangerous uh, approach because it would be to adopt a very superficial uh, consideration uh, and without uh, the necessary careful regard to the needs of this little boy's uh, particular and unique characteristics and circumstances, which you have to consider under Section 1. Um, and the, the, the first thing that you obviously need to bear in mind, of course, that Stanley is extremely vulnerable by virtue of his tender age. Um, he's only he's only three still and he's wholly dependent on his caregivers to meet his physical, emotional and all his welfare needs. This little boy has no idea at all about how to keep himself safe. He's got no awareness of danger. He doesn't even realise when he's tired. Um, he is able, he obviously is somewhat verbal, um, but he can't really uh, explain his wishes and feelings to any significant degree. Um, and so he's De wholly dependent on his caregivers to appropriately recognise and meet his changing needs. Um, but he, he really can't be left to fend for himself and needs a high degree of supervision um, and supervision that uh, entails sensitively attuned and competent parenting. So that's by way of an overview, if I can say at the start. Um, and what Mother says is that it's important to note for Stanley that she is his primary carer. Um, I'm not seeking to criticise the father for his complete lack of involvement engagement in Stanley's life uh, in the latter half of the marriage as it broke down. But the reality is that up until separation uh, last year, father was largely absent from any involvement in Stanley's day to day life. Um, it's, and again, I say it's not a criticism. It's a feature of the fact that father is obviously working very hard at work, uh, dealing with the merger of uh, his firm. Um, but the reality is he was out of the house from seven in the morning to very late at night. And then uh, weekends, he'd often be away playing golf uh, or he'd just be generally exhausted. And so Stanley was very much dependent on mother. And that's uh, been important because this lack of involvement means that Stanley's primary attachment is to his mother. Um, she's his main figure of security. Um, and for a child of this age, that's an extremely important factor uh, to consider. He has started in nursery, I accept, uh, but what mother says is that it's, he's still settling in um, and is getting used to spending more time during the day away from her. Um, but it's it's important to consider when one looks at the father's application that this little boy has really spent very little time away from um, his primary carer. Um, mother does accept that since separation, father has shown more interest in being involved in Stanley life, Stanley's life, and that, that is great. She does support that. Um, but it's been built up gradually uh, in line with what Stanley can manage. Well, um, Ms. Heppenstall, sorry to interrupt you, but um, what does your client say about the proposition that I should um, set up a, a regime whereby Stanley has increasing time with his father between now and the holiday so that he's more used to being away from his mother and with his father, um, in which case Mr Norton submits he will be very well able to manage the week away and that separation that your client is so concerned about. 
Madam, I'm, I'm not surprised that you've suggested that because clearly the one night that he's been having with his father, and I accept that he's do, done full, two full days on the weekends when he stays overnight now, uh, but mother is still concerned that this is actually just bedding in, if I, could, if I can use a colloquial phrase, um, that one night, uh, even if you were minded to say, uh, to increase it to two nights over Easter, it's still very early days and Stanley has is still not used to uh, spending time with his father overnight. Um, he's very anxious and clingy when he returns to mother's care. He doesn't settle immediately. Uh, he bed hops at night and comes in with her. He, he's seeking her comfort and reassurance. So, Madam, I can, I, one can understand that that might be a way of alleviating uh, the difficulties for Stanley. But I think the mother's primary position is it's too much too soon and that even if uh, you were minded to increase the number of nights uh, slightly uh, and, and gradually that even by the end of the, by summer that would still be too much for Stanley to cope with uh, because it's uh, not a situation where he's been used to a regular pattern of substantial time away from mother and so um, I think the mother is concerned that this would still be a pace which would not be uh, commensurate with Stanley's needs. Um, and there is the, the issue that the, the, the mother has about the father's ability to meet his needs practically. She doesn't think that he adheres to uh, Stanley's routine, which she has given him full information about. She wants him to be an involved parent, but Stanley often returns overtired because he hasn't been given his daytime nap, or he's allowed to sleep in the car on the way home and returns uh, bouncing off, off the walls and, and unable to, mother can't settle him. So father pays lip service to um, Stanley's routines, but there's also the issue of the gluten intolerance. Now mother accepts, as she said in her statement, that the GP says it's far too early to be sure about that uh, and they won't test, but she knows that when he's had wheat, actually you can see from his bowel movements, it, it doesn't suit him. And so, Although father says that he doesn't uh, give Stanley gluten free, pro pro he does give him gluten free products and not avoids wheat. She's not convinced that he does that because on the weekends when he stayed overnight with father, she sees the difficulties on the Monday and Tuesday uh, at the beginning of the week. Um, more importantly, also, he is slightly asthmatic. Now, mm -hmm. Mother did invite father along to uh, the GP appointment where they demonstrated how to use the nebulizer for him because uh, obviously he's so little he has to use the face mask. Um, father has no confidence really in being able to utilize this. Um, I, mother accepts that Sandy hasn't actually had cause to use it. Um, but it's still an anxiety for her and I know that she'd want me to uh, put that forward on her behalf. Um, but I accept that uh, he has been present with the GP uh, when that was demonstrated. But uh, well, so prior... still, supposing he, he had another go at um, being shown how to use an nebulizer, it seems to me it's sort of rare, rare, unlikely that uh, Stan is going to have that kind of difficulty since he hasn't had cause to use the nebulizer. But would it reassure your client if there was another opportunity for the father to be shown how to use it? Madam, thank you. Yes, she, she's confirmed that that would be helpful. Um, and I think that would be the case whether he goes on holiday or not. And um, I gather that there's a GP resident in Saint-Lazaire who speaks very good English, who um, the father says, should there be a need, he could call on in any event. What does your client say about that? I think she's been to Sally's there, hasn't she? she? She does know the area very well and uh, that's part of her anxiety that it is a very remote uh, region in the mid-Pyrenees. Uh, yes, there is uh, a local doctor who does speak very good French and in fact they did she accepts to take Stanley there when he was four months old, when he was suffering from croup. But I think her concern, Madam, and I know that she set this out in her statement, is that actually if there was a serious accident, uh, the, the, the largest hospital is Toulouse and that's uh, nearly two hours drive away. She accepts there is obviously a smaller hospital more locally in saint Girard, but uh, I think that she just does have anxieties about that. But she accepts that there is a, a GP locally or a, a French uh, doctor locally 
um, who would be able to assist. But just running through, I, I know, Madam, it's set up. I know my client was very keen for me to set these particular matters out. Stanley mm. not met the twins, and I know that you've canvassed with um, Mr. Norton the possibility of them being introduced. Um, mother doesn't have a particular problem with that now that uh, Stanley has met Cynthia on a couple of occasions. Her priority was to ensure that there was that introduction first before the twins were introduced. But her main concern about going on holiday with uh, the twins is it's all about supervision uh, because this property, as you'll be aware, I mean, it's a stunning property, but it is rambling and the pool is very close to uh, the living room area on the ground floor. There are no fencing, or secure fencing, although at least there wasn't when um, mother was last there when Stanley was four months old. And she's very concerned that uh, with the twins uh, having different needs, that father really will not keep his eye on Stanley. And it's so important with toddlers. Uh, and they can drown in, in, in just the smallest amount of water. That's mother's big anxiety about this property. Um, and obviously there are the trip hazards uh, she set out about the, the, the uneven stone flagging. Uh, yes. There's Arga in the kitchen. I, I don't want to re-rehearse them. They're set out in her. No, day. I've read I've read that very carefully. She's very sauce. concerned about supervision. But finally, it's also the journey time to this sheet. Um, as I, she's, you've seen, Madam, the Google uh, map uh, yeah distance times that she's set out, what will need to happen is that father will have to uh, fly from Gatwick to Toulouse. So clearly he's going to have to allow an hour from his home or some South London where the parties both lived to get to Gatwick. Then there's going to have to be two hours in the airport. It's then a two hour flight. Uh, and of course, there's the time difference to factor in. Then they'll have to pick up a car and uh, get from the airport to uh, saint -Lizier. that's going to be another two and a half hours at least. So we're looking at a total journey time of at least seven and a half hours for Stanley to endure. And it is endurance for the child of this age. And when one factors in the fact that father's suggesting it's for a week's, week's holiday, he's going to have to repeat that on the way back. And mother says this is too much when actually the alternative for Stanley would be a holiday on the south coast Brighton, for instance, is an hour's journey. Uh, this is a child who suffers from travel sickness. Um, it would be much better for him and probably far more enjoyable. He has gained nothing from the French culture uh, or the landscape. I mean, he'd much rather have a bucket and spade holiday, madam, um, if one was considering his wishes and feelings, which of course he's too young to actually uh, articulate. Uh, but the reality is this holiday is more about what father wants uh, rather than what is actually in Stanley's needs. She's also concerned about COVID in France. We, she's no confidence that that will be resolved by the summer, given how uh, delayed they are in relation to vaccines. Madam, I don't want to re rehearse what's set out in my submissions. They are more fully set out there. But in short, Mother's saying this summer, Stanley should have three, strip four nights maximum uh, with his father in the south of England, and that would be appropriate extension of time. Uh, and Sandy would probably really enjoy it. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Miss Evanstall. Um, Mr. Norton, um, is there anything you want to say in response? I have heard from you quite extensively in outlining your application, but is there any response to the points that have just been made? Madam, I just reminded myself to turn myself off mute. Um, the only response I would say is in respect of your suggestion that the father could undertake some further training yes. in relation to the asthma. He's uh, uh, informed me that he has in fact been undertaking his own research and right. has watched some YouTube clips uh, which are readily available. Uh, but if that is insufficient, he would attend another session with the GP if that would alleviate the concerns of the mother. Right. But beyond that, Madam, I don't think there's anything more I can usefully add. Uh, I would just end up repeating either my submissions or my document. Thank you very much. So that um, brings this arbitration to an end. I will um, make sure that the parties have my written determination within seven days um, and um, hopefully before that. So thank you all very much for attending. Right, that ends the formal parts. It may be that um, attendees would like to know what the outcome was. We are going to send out um, a sample determination 
in relation to this arbitration. But in short summary, it may, may not surprise you to hear that the arbitrator allowed the holiday on the basis that there would be some increasing time for Stanley with his father building to four nights before the holiday and that the father would ensure that he was introduced to the twins um, and um, that the father um, satisfied himself that he was able to deal with the asthma issue that the mother was worried about. And um, I know that Owen Mitchell will send out the determination very shortly after this webinar. We have a couple more slides just in which we would like to promote the benefits of arbitration. So I wonder if the slides could be sent up or could be put up now. So as we see it, there are multiple benefits of dealing with a dispute such as this in relation in arbitration rather than through the court process. And in fact, specific issues like schooling, like holidays and so on are ideally suited. But we've listed here the choice, the continuity, the availability of the arbitrator, the fact that they are going to be people who routinely do this kind of work. Um, and the fact that you are able to identify the judge that the parties and their advisors are comfortable with and someone who um, will have read the papers and have had time to do so in advance. Um, parties choose the issues to be arbitrated. They can keep the process wide or narrow. We call it bespoke because the parties own the process and can decide how it's how it's dealt with. And they can negotiate that between themselves and then discuss with the arbitrator in directions exactly how they want to deal with it. And arbitration can be used at any stage of the dispute or of litigation, even if there are court proceedings, they can be adjourned out to arbitration. If they are in um, even in a mediation process and one issue they get stuck on, that one issue can be referred to arbitration. There isn't a pre-requirement to attend a MIAM, of course. The process is quickly is quick. Um, there's there's if one has to think about it, the cost of the arbitrator is more than outweighed by the cost saving. And we would say the reduction in stress and uncertainty of proceedings going on for many months. Um, arbitrations can be included concluded in two weeks from start to finish. Um, contrary to what we're used to these days, certainly in London, of Fahadras being listed four or five months after issue of proceedings. And then we have the further delay to get beyond that. Could we have the next slide, please? So um, it's a flexible process. It's informal compared to court proceedings. When we were able to do them face to face, the parties would even be able to come into the room which would be used for the hearing, which would used to be a room in the arbitrator's chambers or office. They could choose how the chairs were set out and the tables so that they didn't necessarily have to sit across the table from one another if they didn't want to. Um, and now, of course, we do a lot on Zoom or other video platform. But in any event, the parties can deal with it in a way in which they feel comfortable. Um, there isn't um, a requirement to satisfy a judge that the evidence is necessary, but that is a sort of rough, rough rule. You will note that I did consider that the ISW wasn't necessary in this case, but you don't need to go through a part 25 formal procedure. One other benefit that people come to arbitration for is that it is a completely confidential process. Uh, the parties sign up to confidentiality. You don't get a scenario where their names are on a list outside a court and so on, which some parties are concerned about. You have certainty of outcome, you have finality, you have enforceability. Um, and although courts discourage review hearings, the arbitrator can deal with reviews if that's what the parties want. So it's a it's a fully flexible process and it is enforceable. And um, we, we who are um, champions of arbitration hope that there will be more of it in the next months and years. We think it's very much a way forward for resolving disputes outside court. Thank you very much. So I'm going to hand over now for the conclusion by Jenna. 
Uh, thank you, Janet, and to Claire and Andrew for that extremely helpful depiction of children arbitration in practice. I think it really illustrated just how well arbitration can be used to resolve those types of holiday disputes, which in my experience are one of the ones that really lend themselves to, to the process really well. And it's quite easy to persuade clients, I think, to go down that, that route in those types of disputes. And I think particularly for Hugo and Natasha, um, they've managed to actually resolve most of the substantive child arrangements um, for Stanley and you've met, it would be a process that would allow them to resolve that discrete issue without propelling them into extensive litigation through the court process so they get a really swift outcome without the ongoing stress of proceedings. And I, I personally I think it's quite relevant that clients are opting into that together they're doing it as parents it's collaborative they're choosing to have a decision made for them rather than one party deciding to initiate proceedings and the other person being a respondent to that. I think I think that it is highly relevant too. And we as family lawyers know all too well that some cases just need a decision quickly to stem the emotional and financial bleed. So let's move on to some questions. There have been some questions coming in today and um, today and before the seminar, but if anybody has any other questions, please feel free to post them in the Q&A box. Um, so Roz first, um, do you think that arbitration is genuinely cheaper for clients than litigation? I think, well, Janet um, gave a brilliant overview about costs. I think that the initial outlay for the fee for the arbitrator is something that could be, could be seen as a hurdle. However, um, particularly at the moment with the delay, I don't think it ends up being anywhere near as expensive as when we're going through a court process delay, which it almost inevitably will lead to further issues arising as the case progresses with a volley of correspondence. And, and ultimately, I don't think uh, there are any uh, benefits to delaying any issues. It, it is, in my experience, it, it's actually been more cost effective but there is that initial outlay, which can be something that, that puts clients off. We might even be able to deal with a letter of instruction to an SJE, which can be dealt with on paper by an arbitrator. That might take six months resolving solicitor's correspondence just to get a hearing alone. So I, I don't think, um, I think there are actual cost benefits. I agree, uh, Ros, and I think the, the other thing to think about is also you're going to have to pay for your MIAM, you pay your court issue fee, you pay your application for Part 25, an um, application for an independent social worker, it all quickly starts mounting up. Um, so it certainly can be a cheaper option for clients. And there is a range, I suppose, of budget, um, of different arbitrators at different levels with different budgets. Um, so Andrew, um, can you switch to arbitration if you're already in court proceedings? Have you got any experience of the court allowing that or encouraging parties to do that? I would say uh, that I anticipate there'll be greater encouragement by the judiciary to switch to arbitration and alternative methods of dispute resolution. Um, everybody, I think, uh, on this call is likely to know of the significant delays there are in the court process generally obviously made far worse by the COVID pandemic. And those of us who are familiar with the family procedure rules know that within the rules themselves, the court is required to look at each stage of the process to see whether there is an alternative way of resolving the dispute. So in the family procedure rules 3.3, for example, you can adjourn off the proceedings to allow the, parent, the parties to go into an ADR process, including arbitration. So that's my first point. I, I also anticipate, given the pressures on court, that although arbitration is a voluntary process, and that is very much uh, recognised by the rules, I wonder whether the judiciary might seek to persuade the parties to agree to arbitration. If, for example, one party suggests arbitration and the other resists it, at the next directions hearing, why not raise Family Procedure Rules 3.3 and see if the judge can put some little pressure on the slightly unwilling party to go down that process? 
So you Thank certainly you. can move from one to the other. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I, I wonder if a time will come when parties could be criticised actually by the court for unreasonably refusing arbitration in favour of a delay that they might perceive gives them some advantage in the proceedings. We know it's enshrined in the legislation that delay is prejudicial to the welfare of the child. And so I do wonder whether the judiciary might might in time um, be mentioning that in judgments that we see. Um, Claire, can I ask how, how is arbitration working remotely during the pandemic? Um, have you dealt with, with any in chambers where it's been dealt with fully remotely and what have people's experiences of that been? <clears throat> I've done a uh, financial uh, arbitration final hearing remotely uh, sitting as an arbitrator um, and it worked absolutely actually one party was outside the jurisdiction in any event so it probably would always have to have been a hybrid uh, arbitration it works as well as uh, the cbp court hearings work so sometimes there are uh, difficulties but in a, you can normally get over those it works as well um, as the court process does thank you claire and janet what happens if you start off the parties sign there there are one and then somebody decides that they want to pull out of the process. Well, you you, you can't um, simply pull out because you've agreed that you're going to arbitrate. Um, the arbitrator can bring the process to an end. Um, and that is almost always for safeguarding reasons, because if a significant safeguarding issue arises in the course of an arbitration, the arbitrator has to consider whether it's still suitable so uh, it is possible that the arbitrator will have to pull the plug as it were for that reason but otherwise just a party deciding they don't like the process is not good enough so you could in theory carry on and just hear one party and make your determination and janet on a similar theme somebody's asked whether um arbitration is ever appropriate in domestic abuse cases the problem at the moment is that because rightly um, IFLA, the Institute of Family Law Arbitrators, has taken a very cautious approach, it's not within scope where there are significant safeguarding issues which would engage PD12J um, and we are taking that view at the moment. Things are gradually opening up with arbitration, for instance, leave to remove um, out of the jurisdiction was outside scope but now certain leave to remove to Hague either Hague convention the 1980 or 1996 convention are now within scope so it may be that um, the sort of issues that would simply be to do with the breakup of a relationship but not likely to be relevant to practice direction 12j or engage that practice direction we certainly could do and it may be that in time, certain issues of fact finding, um, perhaps the lower level ones, could be the subject of arbitration. But at the moment, we have to go carefully with it. Agreed. And Bros, um, somebody's asked and commented that Janet Baisley is of, is of course brilliant, but as a lawyer, do you worry that the client might blame you if you suggest the arbitrators and then the client ultimately ends up being unhappy with the determination that, that's made? There's always that possibility, but that could be the case in any scenario. Um, I think one way of, of really overcoming that is to look to IFLA to appoint the arbitrator if there's ever going to be a dispute. I mean, almost always in the court scenario, you're going to have somebody who's not happy with the outcome. Um, hopefully those who are engaging effectively and at the right point are going to be deal with the matter constructively and hopefully they won't, won't blame us but there is the option of having IFLA to, a, to select somebody as, a, as an option. Of course and you can also deal with it in the same way you might deal with a single joint expert where you can propose three people to the other side and they choose from your, your list or um, you see if you've got any of the same people perhaps that you're both proposing. Um, so Andrew, have you dealt with any arbitrations or are you aware of any where somebody's acted in person or do, do people have to be represented in, in arbitrations? The rules don't prevent someone acting in person. The uh, 
strong encouragement is that when you're signing the form to agree to arbitrate, you should have some legal advice to know what you're signing, because as Janet has said, once you sign up to arbitration, it is a sort of binding process after that. There's nothing that would prevent arbitration taking place with a litigant in person on one side or even both sides. So, um, one of them encourages people to take uh, legal advice at various stages of the proceeding, but in principle, no. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and Claire, how will the court will, will treat non-cooperative parents in a failed arbitration? And can any reports or findings, I suppose, be the determination, be transported from arbitration into court proceedings? So I'm not quite sure what you mean by failed arbitrator, but if the, uh, the arbitrator makes the decision, uh, it can, of course, be incorporated into a consent order. And actually, un when signing the ARB, once yes, the parties sign up to getting an order in those terms if necessary. And so there would be, I think, very little grounds for someone who was unhappy with uh, or not wanting to, to, to carry it through uh, to object on that basis. Um, mm -hmm. The courts would uphold uh, the determination reached in the arbitration in that way. And how is it enforced? How do you actually obtain your order if the other person isn't cooperative? You submit your application to the court under the, the, the process that uh, is prescribed where there is an arbitration determination already uh, prepared. Okay, thank you, Claire. And, and Janet, um, somebody has asked, how do arbitrator's powers compare to those of the court? For example, can an arbitrator deal with issues that aren't raised in the ARB 1CS? I think in, in your particular arbitration you were just dealing with, there was the suggestion of an extension to the child arrangements, not just dealing with the holidays. Yes, um, I think you have to go carefully because this is a voluntary process and the parties sign up to it and specify the scope of it. In this one, um, we took the view that it was legitimate for the arbitrator to push for and if need be impose some specific child arrangements to facilitate the holiday. So since the holiday issue generally was left to the arbitrator, it was okay for the arbitrator to tweak the arrangements of the child to make sure that the holiday worked in, uh, in the welfare interests of Stanley. But I think if you were going to um, go much beyond that, you would have to have the consent of the parties. Agreed. Um, and perhaps just a couple more questions. There seem to be lots coming in. Um, so if we don't get through them all, we will try and respond to them all um, later on. Um, but Andrew, who, who, is the who are the typical clients that you see coming for arbitration? Is it really the, the purview of the wealthy who want confidentiality? I think that's the perception. I'm not entirely clear that's the reality and certainly initially uh, that was certainly the, that was the experience but we are receiving and I'm sure many people are many more inquiries about arbitration at all levels uh, and we particularly chose this dispute because it seems entirely likely that we are going to have such inquiries um, between now and, and August um, and they're not just a purview of the, the rich and those who want anonymity. Um, as a number of people said already, the benefit of arbitration is the bespoke nature of it. And so uh, parties who perhaps aren't particularly wealthy or perhaps aren't in full dispute can identify a single issue upon which they're unable to agree and go to arbitration. And because of the uh, speed, it can be a relatively cost effective process. Um, it's in, in terms of choice of arbitrator and there are many arbitrators in, on the market and you can choose an arbitrator whose fees and general uh, um, approach fits the budget uh, of your particular client. Yes and perhaps one for Ros this question is is arbitration London centric Ros as somebody who practices in London and Manchester and much further beyond? I think that it has been um, but I think that the, the more we have been um, engaging in remote um, working and, and dealing with cases in that manner, I think it has become more widespread across um, the regions. I also think that um, having looked at the IFLA website, you can see that people across 
the country are qualifying. This is all about awareness, really. And really, we need to promote it as practitioners. The judiciary are already doing so. So it's about public awareness as well. And I think that that will mean that we will see up and down the country um, more use of arbitration as a, as a method of resolving disputes. So yes, it has been, in my opinion, but I think that, that those barriers are going and people are using it across the regions too. Thank you, Rose. And perhaps just to wrap up the questions, if Janet and Andrew, you could perhaps explain to our audience the type of disputes that might be suitable for arbitration that you are before the court. I'm particularly mindful, for example, of His Honour Judge, Judge Wildblood's um, widely publicised judgment last year of a dispute about which which junction of the M4 or handover of the child might take place. Um, so there might be some things that in particular might be, for example, capable of determination on paper um, by arbitrators. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yes, I'm, I'm happy to um, give some thoughts about that. I think it's, it's a very flexible process, but I think that single issues leave to permanent leave to remove from the jurisdiction and the temporary holiday type removal are ideal. The school issues, I've dealt with school issues both on submissions and in paper and indeed on one occasion where there's more money than cents with an expert um, educational psychologist. Um, so there's a wide variety, but I think people need to know that there are, there are all sorts of ways of using arbitration. You can use it for everything. One of the things that I think is a real advantage is that if you want to say deal with a school issue and who should pay the fees so financial and children issue together you can go to someone like Claire who's dual qualified and have it all done at once and in fact if you wanted to deal with all your um, dispute financial on divorce and children on divorce you could have it all done in one go by one arbitrator and I think that's just um, illustrative of the very broad scope of arbitration um, Mr Justice Moore last year said where he was asked to settle a letter of instruction effectively for a um, you know, financial case to a single joint expert, and I know Ros has touched on this, said, well, this is the ideal issue to be referred to arbitration um, so that you can even be in a court process and one discrete issue, which as Ros has said, might take many months of solicitor's correspondence to resolve. You can just get an arbitrator to do it and in fact, in a way that I would have thought was much more cost effective. So the, the scope is really very broad. I don't know if Andrew has anything to add to that. Well, I was I was in fact I'm going to mention that uh, Mr Justice Moore uh, decision because I think that demonstrates that we do need to think more widely about various elements of dispute resolution, but obviously arbitration that we're discussing today, because I think there might be a perception that it's a certain case is for arbitration, a certain case is for court. And there's the flexibility to move in and out of both. If the parties agree an issue of arbitration, they can do that and then go back into court proceedings. The rules permit that. Um, and so my suggestion would be people think very widely about this and uh, understand the flexibility and the opportunities that arbitration um, gives. Well, thank you all for the answer to that. I think we've all seen what the advantages of arbitration are, and I think we mustn't underestimate the importance of the small things to our clients, the availability of conference rooms. I think some of our clients are often incredulous when they have to stand outside court and you know have those discussions around other people. So, and they're at the heart of all of this, aren't they? The people we are helping and their experience of arbitration, certainly, for us at Irwin Mitchell, we haven't had a negative experience. We haven't had negative feedback from clients at all about it. They've all given really positive feedback. And I think that's the, the, the point that really matters is that clients, when they do it, really, really like it and, and see it as, as a benefit to them. Um, so I think it, what we've really demonstrated today is just how accessible and effective arbitration can be. Um, and we've long as family lawyers triage cases at the outset and talk to clients about mediation um, and you know how you're going to go in your case right at the beginning and I think arbitration needs to be one of those tracks really that we open up at the beginning and we keep under review throughout our, our cases and not just when your final hearing is being pulled by the court 
a few days beforehand. Um, so perhaps just before we finish, I thought this was quite illuminating um, when I was doing a bit of research for this webinar. Um, and on the launch of the scheme of children arbitration in 2016, the then chair of IFLA, Lord Falkner, um, said as follows, and I'm going to quote him. The new children arbitration scheme will enable couples to resolve disputes concerning parental responsibility of children more quickly, cheaply and in a more flexible, less formal setting than a courtroom. Will also guarantee confidentiality where that is required or necessary. These are all important ingredients to minimising conflict and supporting the best interests of children. At a time when our courts are under significant pressures, the availability of arbitration for children matters builds on the long and proud tra tradition arbitration has in other areas and gives parents and practitioners another tool with which to resolve fi family disputes. All of that could be said to be as true, if not more relevant today than it was almost five years ago. So since then, the scope of children arbitration is extended to include certain international matters. Certainly, I think minds have opened to the scheme and the heavy workload of the family court has increased even more than any of us could have imagined with the added complexity of a global pandemic. And um, so we've got a greater emphasis on opening up the family courts and we're in the run up to the president's transparency review expected this summer. And it's a timely re reminder, I think, of the added benefit of confidentiality for those clients to whom consider it to be essential. And um, so with all of its advantages, we really need to embed it, I think, in family law culture in the same way that we did with with mediation. Um, and I think that webinars like this to provide information are really, really important. So I hope that for everyone listening today, that will help to continue the conversation about children arbitration, which I personally think has become more enthusiastic and louder over the last year. And I hope that this time next year, you know, we'll be talking about it even more than we are now. So the time is ticking on and the working day is beginning and I'm sure inboxes are starting to fill up for everybody. So all that now remains is for me to thank our brilliant presenters. Claire's had to dash off for a conference, as is the life of, of council. So thank you to Claire in her absence and thank you also to Janet Baisley of Queen's Council and Andrew Norton of Queen's Council for their brilliant um, mock arbitration and also to Ros Beaver. So thank you all for joining us and for your insightful questions. If you've got any further questions or if there are anything we've missed, our contact details will shortly appear in the Q&A box, so do get in touch with us and we'll endeavour to respond to any of those questions that you may have by email. And please do let us have your feedback on today's webinar, what we did well and what you'd like to see us do um, in the future using the link in the chat box below. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day.